Hello, welcome to the May 26th, 2023 Club Cubase live stream. My name is Greg Undo and I'm the host of the live stream. Um, and if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can submit questions in advance by sending an email to Club Cubase at steinberg.de. I think I've been having some problems with the email address. Hopefully we'll have that resolved uh, early next week. Um, it just kind of gets forwarded to my my work email and I haven't been getting those as much but generally you could send it to clubcubase at steinberg.de or you could just ask the questions in the live chat field when asking questions if you could specify which version of Cubase that you're running whether it's Cubase LE, AI, Elements Artist or Pro um, also if you could specify which version number so if it's 10, 10.5, 11 or 12 and which operating system that information is always helpful um, when asking questions, or is that my ability to answer questions in a real-time manner will soon be eclipsed by the number of questions. I'll try my best throughout the live stream to catch up and get all the questions uh, uh, answered in the in the in a chronological order. Uh, and if we should have all the topics that are in the live stream, we should have all those uh, indexed with timestamps and posted, uh, later this evening. Uh, so, and if you wanted to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to cubaseindex.com and Jan from Stockholm has been kind enough to create, uh, that website. We also have two people we want to give special thanks to who serve as moderators. Um, so that would be Agent K and Jazz Dude. They're not Steinberg employees. They just really do this out of the kindness of their hearts. Um, and we also want to give a special shout out to Jazz Dude for all of his tireless efforts on the Cubase Nation Discord. It's a wonderful resource of information that's available. Um, one of the things that, um, so once again, uh, my name is Greg Undo. I'm based, I work for Yamaha Corporation of America and I'm based in the United States, just outside of Washington DC area. Uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, and I'm the host of the live stream. If you're watching this live, please feel free to introduce introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Um, also, uh, we'll have our last live stream of the month on Tuesday, next, this upcoming Tuesday. We'll have a special guest who will be kind of sharing production insights with kind of a legendary career that's involved uh, working with people such as Whitney Houston, Bob Dylan, uh, Burt Bacharach, Brian Wilson, Dolly Parton, a whole slew of people, kind of a, a who's who of the music industry. This guy is, has done production and played guitar on many tracks, so we look forward to have him as our special guest, and we'll share some more information on that. And if you want it, uh, so that will be a Zoom meetup. We'll provide the uh, invite uh, on the next meeting, so we'll go for about two hours for the live stream and go two hours hopefully for our Zoom meetup and share some wonderful insights with uh, our special guest. All right, with that, we will go ahead and start with the questions. Uh, so we see the first question, is Cubase better than Ableton DAW? So yeah, I think Cubase is probably the most comprehensive DAW solution, and it really doesn't limit you for particular workflows. Uh, whereas I think you know, particular programs, you're kind of always work one particular way, uh, and you're kind of almost predisposed to have particular workflows in your music. You know, you can often sometimes know which program that people use because they use the tools in the same exact way. And I think Cubase is a lot more fluid and a lot more creative of a tool. But you could ask the same question on uh, perhaps an Ableton live stream, see what they say. All right, so we see uh, for Ed Rugman. Uh, his question is, uh, thanks for answering my question the other day about using the glue tool on two MIDI clips and merging bug. Uh, I wasn't quite clear enough about the issue to recreate it. Uh, set the MIDI record mode to allow recording to lanes. Uh, record onto a small MIDI track some notes. Okay, so I will come over here. Let's record some notes. Okay, so we recorded some notes. Um, and it says, uh, stop and resize the MIDI clip that, so that some of the notes are now outside of the MIDI clip boundary, say half the size. Okay, so we'll take this. And I'll make it two measures long. Okay, uh, now record over the MIDI clip again so that it is recording 
into a new lane, perhaps playing notes exactly where the previous notes were that were placed before moving the edge of the first event. Okay. So now I'll go ahead and record again. I'll play lower note. Okay. So we see that, so record it to, um, to there, and we have the overlapping events, okay, and if we wanted to see these as our lanes, we could, so we're going to have these set up, um, I'll just check my record mode, so I'll just, I'll choose this to be new parts for record, so I'll start over again. Okay, so. Okay, and record again, lower note. Okay, so now we look at these, we'll have our, but let's say before I recorded that note, I'm gonna resize the event according to the directions and now I'll record a lower note okay so we take uh, we look at this we have our two different lanes so now we have our events that will be merged uh it says now use a glue tool to glue the two events together from the from the two lanes together uh it says on my computer the glue to the glue tool doesn't take into consideration the change of the event end all right so i'm gonna grab my glue gun here okay so you see where the the event from the previous recording was extended i think it's because it's still within the boundaries let me try just a different method all right so let's say i will just record so we have this resized and i'll record so we could Okay, so now that we have kind of the part boundaries, we'll just come over here. So if I wanted to join these together, so let's say if I had glued these two events, we'll see if the, so we have long notes in the longer take. All right, so we see that, that those notes are still gonna sound the higher notes. Uh, let me try just out of curiosity if I merged the two of them together with the glue gun. All right, it's still there and I'm gonna, so I think I, um, so and I think Ed's point is that the events that were there are now merging uh, between them. So let me just see if we put this into um, delete overlaps, if we have that set in the preferences. So if I come here, I'll just do recording again. and resize okay and let's see if we glue these together what happens it still seems like those events um, 
I'll play around with this some more, Ed, and see, you know, there's a, a whole bunch of different options. So let me see if I do this. Um, if we get a replace mode, I'll just try this quickly. So we will resize here. Okay, but it's not going to create our lanes. And let me see if I put this into merge between the two, if that changes the behavior. here let's so those will be so it looks like if it's set in merge mode and we glue the let's try gluing them together so if it's set to be recorded into merge mode it looks like that the original take isn't carried over so let me know if you have your if you try this with midi if you're doing linear cycle recording into MIDI record modes into merge. Um, and let me know if that is helpful for you. If not, I'll play around with it some more over the weekend. But thank you for the detailed explanation. All right, um, so we have a question. Um, is it possible to have two colors on the same track in the mixer? One is usual and one on the same track title someone knows so i think if we're looking at the mixer the mixer will have kind of one uh like the events themselves can have uh multiple colors so if you wanted to uh you know have different colors for verse and chorus you could do stuff like that but i think on the mixer that we could have one uh that's kind of designed for we have the one kind of track color um so one is usual and one and one on same track title someone knows so i think it's going to be you know kind of set up for one common uh one common uh color in the mix console so All right, so we see Jazz Dude, we see Stefan from Sweden, we see uh, Jan from Cubase Index. Uh, so we have a question uh, from Isidore Elias. Uh, I would like to load non-drum sounds, honks, tweaks, splats, etc., cetera, uh, onto the pads in Groove Agent SE and play them and record them from my V drums. Is this possible? If yes, how? So let's come over to uh, we have an instance of Groove Agent here. I will, let's say, we will cut the kit because we have samples on here. So we have just kind of a, a brand new instance of Groove Agent without a kit loaded. Let's come over here to, uh, I think I have some like game sound effects. All right, let me just change one of my preferences. All right, so I want that as a kick. I want that as my snare. So it's really just kind of dragging any of the sounds. So now all you have to do is you could just play these. Uh, 
and then you could play any sound, any sample directly uh, using your uh, using your electronic drum kit. And if you wanted to remap the sounds from your electronic drum kit, so that you know you could click on the uh, use hardware controller. And I think you could just use the E drum controller one. I think that's kind of uh, set up to work with Roland drum kits. So yeah, just kind of drag and drop. All right, wonderful. See Jan from Cubase Index. We have Nick on as well. Wishing everyone had a good week. All right, we have Benny from Sweden. We have Arnold checking in from Germany. All you well checking in from Switzerland. We have Patrick from India. It's glad to be on. We have Captain Energy Music from Pennsylvania. Robbie Bowling from Dallas, Texas. Matt Elston from London. All right, uh, Kenny Jobson, just nice to see everyone again. So glad you can make it. All right, so we see um, from Patrick, uh, Greg, how to use Groove Builders with third-party plugins and how to create our own groove with it. Um, so I'm not sure if uh, what you mean by groove builders is that like a pattern. Um, so I'm not sure if if the groove builders is an instrument or if it's like content, like you know MIDI loops or something like that. But any any content that you have, whether it's audio or MIDI, and you're like, okay, I really like this one uh, particular. So let's say I have something like that, and then I drag it in. Um, if I go to the quantize panel, um, I could just take any, so let's say we look at this and we're like, okay, we like the feel of this particular uh, drum pattern here. So let's say, okay, let's get to my drum editor, and I like this feel, I could just drag it to the quantize panel, and then I could copy over that groove, and then we could use that to contact anything else. And if it's an audio file, we would just from the uh, sample editor, we would just go to hit points. And then we could just uh, under the create tab, create groove. But Patrick, if you could, uh, you know, clarify if groove builders is a content set or if it's an instrument, I'm not familiar with it uh, by name like that, but. All right, so we see um, from Dallas LaRue, uh, how can I get songs from iTunes into Cubase to use for reference tracks? Uh, is there a better source to use? Um, so generally, as long as you could, you know, get it converted to uh, like an MP3 or a WAV file, which I believe you can do inside of iTunes is to save it as a WAV file. So I'm not sure if it's, you know, protected content. But if you save it as just a WAV file, you could load it into, I'm sorry about that, hit the wrong button on my computer here. But once you uh, have that set up, you could just load it in as an audio track. Let's see. Computer's gonna wake up. There we go. So, um, but yeah. So I, I don't think you know there is protection on a lot of a lot of content in iTunes. Uh, you know, for digital rights management. So some people will you know convert it to you know in like an MP3 or a WAV file, and then just load that in directly. You know, and use that as a reference track. And if you have the audio CD, um, you could just come directly to, uh, come over to uh, import audio CD. I know a lot of people will go to YouTube and get a, like a YouTube to MP3 converter. I'm not sure how legal it is. Um, but, and then that could just save it as an MP3 file that you could import directly into Cubase. You just kind of type the YouTube website. All right, great to have Soren from Sweden on. 
Yeah, wonderful to have Mark Rabin from Montana. Okay, so we see uh, from Dallas LaRue says, I play guitar in minor pentatonic scale. I can find the major pentatonic scale and scale system, but not the minor. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, so let's come over to, let's say your scale system. You could always create your own scale. So let's say, I'll just come over to the, it might be considered a blues two scale. We'll, we'll just take a look. Um, so let's come over here and just set up musical scales. So if you wanted to just do a new scale, you could say, okay, I want it to be like C, E flat, uh, F, G, B flat. And then you could um, just come over and create your own scale directly there for scale assistant. So let's just come over here to factory defaults and we'll just see if there's one in there. So yeah, just come over and add a scale and then you could just, and it's gonna put it in the tonality. It's gonna start with C, but the, the scale will work for whatever tonality you have based on the editor scale. So you just put in, So here it just kind of sees it as uh, a pentatonic scale. It's just, you may see like here, it's this the D sharp pentatonic so it's the same notes um you know the pentatonic major minor are just inverted pentatonic scales so but if you needed to actually um set that up you, you could set it up just by going to add scale and then you could call it a minor pentatonic but it's just basically an inverted major pentatonic scale All right, so we see uh, my Cubase 12 can't open project. Uh, Cubase closes in process. How can I recover uh, crushed project? So one of the things you could do is just take the project and try going to import tracks from project, select the particular project. So you can say, okay, I wanna take this and start with a brand new. I'll just, just, I'll just come here. We'll say new project, we'll create empty. So now I have empty projects, try to, we could load it in, kind of add a different, different level. So going to import tracks from project. So say, let's come over here to this project and I'll hit import. Then I could select all and hit okay. And then my project can be imported directly like that as well. So try just doing the uh, import tracks from project and selecting the project. Often when a project's not loading, it could be related to a third party plugin. So if you start Cubase by holding down on a Mac command option shift or alt control shift on windows, you could start it without third party plugins and, and see if you could open up the project that way. But either, either of those two methods, uh, should work for you. Patrick says that Cubase is much better than Ableton. So, uh, so Alan Mann asks, uh, is there a simple way to record the metronome to an audio track in Cubase 12 elements as signature track is not available? Um, let me just see if I could go to elements. I think I may have it loaded here.
So you could always just take a quick like click track pattern and maybe just render that as an audio file. just while we get it booted up. So let's say if we come over All right, so if I was in Cubase Elements 11, what I would do is probably something like this, where I would say, okay, let's add an instrument track. Let's go to Groove Agent SE, which comes with, I will load up just kind of a generic kit. And now I find So let me just So let's say we want to put in like F sharp one. Um so I would just come over and say, okay, we're gonna do one bar and we could switch our editor to the drum editor. Let's go to F sharp one. I'm going to just put in quarter notes drag across all right let's say I want an accent on the first one and then what we could do is we just go to export audio mix down and we'll call this click. And what we want to do is to put it into the project. So we could um, just create an audio track. And let me just set the locator range around it. So export. And if I don't have it record enabled, I'll just do the export one more time. And then you could just have your click track as an audio file. Um, obviously, if you have Cubase Pro, I know that's a bit of a left-handed approach to do it. Um, so if you're just kind of sending, and in Cubase 12 Pro, you could go to Project, to Signature, Track, and once we have this activated, so you're going to have to render like an audio file if you wanted to, but you know, in Cubase Elements, and for those that have Cubase Artist or Pro, I think we could just, I think this is an artist as well, if you get a Signature Track, you could just say Render audio click between the left and right locators and that will make uh, the um, the click track between the left and right locators just by going to your signature track there so i know it's a little you get to jump through a couple ho hoops to make it work on the cubase elements so Okay, so we have um, 
Patrick asked Greg, is there a way to select empty sections in between the tracks in a project logical editor, like tails and heads on selected tracks? Um, all right, so let's see if we could do this. So I don't know a way in a project logical editor, but let's say if I had um, like this audio file here and I wanted to repeat that. So I think we could choose to snap to events. So if we just wanted to come over here and now as we just, you know, so now that we grab the range tool, we could select the region between the events and it's going to snap to the event starts and ends. So as opposed to doing it on grid. So if we have grid selected here, it's going to snap to the grid, but not necessarily to the events. So you could just say, okay, let's just switch this to events. And now it's going to automatically snap in the space between different events. So I don't know a way to do that between, um, you know, the with the project logical editor, but you know, you could do it just by using the range tool and then just choosing to, you know, instead of setting the snap from grid, uh to events and then as we do this it'll just automatically snap so it doesn't go past the the event start or end it'll kind of snap to the end and to the start of the next event so let me know if that's helpful okay so joe owens asks uh, hi greg cubase pro 12 i've used a time warp tool to move grid to a played guitar and the click matches up. Uh, if I do a one bar drum beat, try to replicate it by dragging, it does not snap to the to the grid. Uh, it's just an exact copy of the first bar. Okay, so it could be that, you know, we need to make that snap to musical mode. So let me just kind of, um, see if I start off with okay so let's say if I've now adjusted um, let's say I don't know what the actual tempo is um, of my event here so let's say I, my tempo is set to 140 um, and let's say I listen to my guitar part and I have gone through and let's say I just kind of went through my warp grid here and I say, okay, we want, and I want measure two to be kind of right here and probably measure three to be here. And so let's say if we just listen to this, I'll put my click track on. So measure five will fall there. So let's just. So we have like just a little anticipation of the beat here. So let's say. All right, and we'll just kind of slide over just a little bit and say, okay, this is. So I want that as the downbeat here. And we have that. So let's say this is our grid that we made and may not be the most accurate. And we look at our tempo map. We're gonna see that we'll have kind of our probably slight tempo changes going on. All right, so now we want a drum loop to match that. So I'll just come over here. All right, so I'm gonna take that drum loop. We're gonna start it 
at the same beat. And what I want to do is you probably, you, the drum loop when I load it in now is it's gonna play back at its original tempo. So what I need to do is to take the drum loop here and put it into musical mode. And then that drum loop will So now that the drum loop is in musical mode, set right here, it's gonna follow the tempo changes. From the guitar part that we made. So if the event isn't in musical mode, it's not going to align to the grid once it's in musical mode. Otherwise, it's gonna play back at its original tempo. Now we're gonna to talk to follow the tempo tracks so that the tempo derived from the guitar performance is now here. And if we wanted to copy those, both of those events, I could just come here, let's just copy this out, that those will always, you know, once we have the tempo map set, it's gonna, you know, the drums will then follow the tempo map of the event. So make sure it's in musical mode. See, so Heartbreak Time Machine says he came from Sonar, and Cubase is so much better. It's great. All right, wonderful to see Jesse Carmichael on the live stream. Hope you're doing well, buddy. Uh, and we see just a uh, clarification from, uh, it says the drum bar is MIDI. So make sure that, um, you know, one of the things you could do if you have, let's say a MIDI loop, um, I may have a project to show this. So let me just take a quick look. see okay so before you do this if you have the MIDI event there could be one little crucial stage Joe with this um, so if it is a MIDI event, you know, let's say um, I come here and I have like a groove agent part and I have just a quick event here. So let's say I just want to put my kick on and I wanted this kick pattern here to follow the, uh, the, the audio of, follow the tempo. But the, but if it's the MIDI event is already in the event. I'll just show you the trick. So let's say we listen to the audio here. All right. So what happens a lot of times before you start doing like, uh, like, you know, before you start doing time warp stuff, come over here and first you want to make sure that the MIDI event is locked. All right, so let's say now, so we see that my, like these aren't matching up. So my drums are perfectly on the grid. So when we look at our editor for this particular event, we can see our drums, our kick is falling directly on the grid. So I'm going to uh, do a tempo detection, but this would be the same if you were doing, um, like maintenance this we could think of this as an automated process so i'm going to say analyze and now we have our tempo detection all right so now if i didn't lock the event the midi timing here would change 
based on the tempo changes. So now what I do is I unlock the event and we'll say, okay, I think we have a pickup note here. So what I'm gonna do now is just move this event here to let's say the downbeat. And now that I'm going to just copy this particular kick drum pattern. And since we know what the tempo is of the audio event as we listen to it now. So if I just want to come over here. So if you have the MIDI data on the event itself, as you start doing the time warp tool, that's going to alter the original MIDI part. So if the drum loop is already in the project before, make sure that you lock the events. And then when you're finished with the time warping that you then unlock the events and then they will stay on the grid position. So let me know if that's helpful, Joe. Sorry, my chat field just jumped on me. All right, we're glad that Mark Rabin's dog Stella is able to jump on, stomp on the like button, so. Glad you, you can make it today. All right, so we see a question from Terry Gray. Great to see you on the live stream. Um, says, is there an easy way to move whole sections versus course around without lasso, lasso selecting and dragging? I thought the arranger track would make it easier. So if you, you know, what you could do is, you know, the arranger track, is not necessarily selecting the events, but the arranger track will be used for, um, you know, basically, you know, defining a range of a, of a particular project. So let me just revert this. All right, so let's say, okay. So if I wanted to like, you know, repeat a whole section I could hold down like control or command plus shift that would globally select and I say okay I wanted to get rid of that so with the range tool I could just hit delete if we undo uh, and if I just come over and let's see so that was the backspace key will delete um, I could also just can uh, I think it's control or command shift plus X would kind of just move that particular region. Um, and if I wanted to duplicate that region, we could do that. We could also just say, okay, I want this part and I could just hold down Alt or Option and make a copy. What the arranger track is going to allow us to do is to set up, not necessarily for moving events globally, but what we could do is set up the arranger track To define like our verse course different portions of our project and we could have subsections within a particular project and now I could create a new play order in a non-linear fashion so we could just come here and once that this is activated we could turn it on and as we play it'll play back in kind of a non-linear so let's say once we get to the end of D, instead of continuing to go on, we could just go straight to So we could just have kind of different portions to do that, but you know, maybe Terry, if you just want to use you know, again, just like control shift and say, okay, I wanted to get rid of that. I could do
do that. Or if I wanted to come over and just move those parts or hold down command or your option or alt and just make copies of parts, we could do it just kind of like that. So the arranger track is not necessarily where the arranger events are, you know, if you move these, that's just, we could think of the arranger event as just defining the selection of time, not not moving a block of events. And if you have everything in folders, you could also just come over here and say, okay, I want to take all these tracks and you can put it into a folder and just move that. And I want to select that folder and duplicate that folder and all the parts within the folder can just simply be treated as one single event. So let me know if that's helpful, Terry, and great to see you on the live stream. All right, wonderful to see Razel from Denmark. All right, and we have Jonathan Van Ryan checking in from San Antonio. I miss going to San Antonio, I haven't been there in a couple years. All right, all right, great to see John Barry from the English, sunny ring, English Riviera. All right, we have John Costigan just saying hello to Cubasers everywhere. All right, uh, so we see um, from Patrick, and this may have been with his uh, groove question, uh, it says, um, how to use groove sync with MIDI modifier? What's the difference between panel and MIDI modifier? So, you know, we could see kind of your swing percentage here, you know, and again, where we could just kind of drag events over to create like swing patterns. So, you know, the it's just a, it's the same functionality so if we have uh, a MIDI event and we're in the MIDI modifiers, uh, either from the track here, you know, the swing percentages are, can, you know, be the same. So if we wanted to even come over here to the MIDI inserts that you'll notice that the, you know, if you get to the quantizer plugin, these swing settings. So you just see kind of swing settings in different locations so that if you're here and you wanted to apply a swing, or if you're in the quantizer panel, you just want it on playback, you want the MIDI modifiers just on playback and not to be embedded within the event, but just on playback, it gets processed. But the percentages, I think I'm almost 99% sure would be identical. Uh, just when you do this and you quantize it, that will actually alter the events. And when you're doing it in the MIDI modifiers or doing on the MIDI inserts, this would process the effects until you go to the MIDI and choose freeze MIDI modifiers. Then it's embedded into the event. Otherwise, it's just processing it on playback. All right, so we see, um, does Cubase offer a function that makes it possible to generate notes on a sheet of music from WAV files? So it's intended to do it for, we could do it for monophonic sources, and we'll show you how we could do that. So we'll just come over to, uh, or revert this. So if you want to do it for a vocal or a bass part, saxophone, stuff like that, we could do so. And we would do it in conjunction with um, Very Audio. So we'd come over here to Very Audio. And once we have this kind of the analysis done um, at this point uh, within our functions, we'll choose extract MIDI and we'll make a new MIDI track. We could retain the dynamics. So we'll come over here, we'll close that. And now we can see our MIDI event. And now if I wanted to see that in notation view, we could just come over here, we'll adjust our score. And if we wanted to kind of clean up. And let's say our key is in A.
So then you can take that base performance and kind of print it out. So again, uh, for monophonic sources, you would need to convert it into MIDI in very audio. And then once it's in MIDI, uh, just um, then you could just take it directly to the score editor. All right, thanks for all the great questions. Wonderful to see Gareth on from Bilbao, Spain. Terry Gray said he had no idea the musical scale setup existed. Yes, yeah, so when you need to do a bar talk augmented scale, it'll be there for you. You can still make it. Heartbreak Time Machine says, yeah, I've never seen this scale set up before either. So we'll give you that feature free, and it's not even Christmas. And it may not be your birthday, but just for watching the live stream, um, you are have access to creating your own scales. Gare says he's currently living in the past. All right, so we see Gareth asks, uh, can you do scales across two octaves? Um, so I don't know of any scales that are different, uh, you know, have different intervalic relationships depending on the octave. I think it's always going to be the same. So, but you, you'd be able to see it. Um, so once we're here and we're in the scale assistant, um, you know, it's, I think it's going to be the same, uh, same scale regardless if it's one octave or two octaves. So, you know, even though we see one octave depicted, it would translate over all the octaves. All right, so Matt Elder asks, um, hi Greg, I was just wondering uh, why when I try to edit and quantize drums, Cubase will just crash on me in most cases. I'm using Cubase 12 Pro with an i9 iMac um, 2019. Um, so it seems like it's, um, I, so I'll, I'll just try and I'll show you how I would quantize drums. So let's say if I wanted to take um, this performance here, which made the drums. So say if I wanted to listen to the drums with the click track, what every drummer hates you to do in session. It's like that snare fill was sped up. So how I would choose to quantize drums, and you could tell me if you're doing it kind of the same way, Matt, is um, I'm going to first place them all kind of into a folder. So I have all my drums into the drum folder. Um, I will just come over here and find the hit points. I'm just going to double click on the events and we'll just come over here and we want to set the threshold so it's not uh, going through different elements that are like the toms that are bleeding through and the snare. So let's say, okay, I did that for the kick. Let's find the hit points for snare. These are often pretty common. So here we have like the hi-hat I don't want to include those or the toms. And let's find our, that said that was our snare. And in this case, we want to also find the hi-hat. So that's pretty rhythmically significant. Um, so now that I have all these together, I'm going to place them into group editing. Um, so now I'm going to open up the quantize panel. So once we have our quantized panel open um, and I have group editing enabled, now we could set a priority. So I could say I want my kick and let's say my snare to have second highest priority and my hi-hat to have like the third highest priority. I want to quantize this to let's say 16th notes. Um, all right, so as we've done this, it's placed kind of markers across all of my drum parts. So as we listen to it here, and again, we'll solo the drums. So 
So now what we want to do is, so we created the warp markers um, at this stage. All right. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. We'll say 16th notes. All right, let me just open up the quantize panel again here. Okay, so we're gonna create our slices. So now it's created like thousands of, of little slices. We say 16th notes. Uh, so we could choose to come over here and quantize. So we've now quantized and moved all the events and sometimes that will leave gaps. And what we want to do is just to cross fade between all of those gaps. And now when we listen to it with the drums, and we have our drum fill. And then that's how I usually quantize drums. So let me know, Matt, if that's the technique that you used in quantizing drums. Um, you know, now you could also kind of do it manually using uh, the uh, free warp tool on the project window if you wanted to, but that's kind of a, a pretty tried and true method. So let me know, Matt, if that's how you quantize your drums. All right, so it says, um, I set up an expression map and noticed a dynamics section. Uh, when I draw Forte, for example, will the volume increase by raising the fader or does it increase the velocity? Thanks, Greg. All right, so let's take a look. Um, I think we could get it set up. So let me just come over to this piece. Thank you for all wonderful questions. And if you've learned a new tip or trick, make sure that you do hit the like button. That enables us to continue to do these live streams offered as a service for everyone. Okay, so let's say if we want to go to um, let me see where we Set this up if I haven't done this in a long time. And I think you could have it go either way with the dynamics. I'm trying to remember where it was set up. Um, just make this foot this a little higher for my own. Okay, so if you go to your dynamics mapping, um, you could have it, so when you come here, we could choose to <clears throat> change velocities or send value or send controller. So you could have it send controller directly to your, whatever controller your instrument does, or you could have it send MIDI volume or just have it change velocities. And to access that, just go to the, uh, upper left hand corner where the dynamic is and then you can go to your dynamic setup and then you could choose directly there what you want the dynamics to control so if you want it to be uh, midi cc 11 or midi cc 7 or velocities depending on what on how the actual instrument is responding then you could set it up to match
All right, Braxel says hello to everyone. Just wondering how everyone is doing. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> Gareth says I should send his guitar part to Drake, so yeah. I, I know many people work with him, so we'll pass it along to them. G give you, so you can be one of 15 writers on a song. All right, so we see value just uh, popped in to quickly like. He's currently in a session. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we see Bruce saying hi to all the Cubasers, and he made it today so he could hit the like button on his way in. Thank you for that. All right, so we see, uh, hello, is Cubase planning to make any AI-powered plugins like the ones that clean background noise, separate vocals, instruments in the song? So, yeah, we already do that with Spectral Layers. It has a lot of AI tools so that can clean up background noise, separate vocals and instruments. So if you want it to, um, here, I'll just show you real quick if you haven't seen it before. So, yeah, we've already been doing that for quite a bit. So let's say I want to take um, this project here. I'll just revert it. All right, so let's say I have like a two track mix here. Let me let you know. let me tell you lies about myself. So if we just go to spectral layers, uh, and you get a Spectral Layers 1 with your license in Cubase, and there's a Spectral Layers Pro. Uh, and Spectral Layers 1 can remove the vocals, um, and you could do, you know, like spectral editing, so it's not, uh, so it's more kind of frequency dependent on your editing, but, you know, in the Pro version, we could come over here and just say, let's unmix stems on this particular project and we could do like vocals drums bass other piano so i'll just come right over here let it do its magic on the song so this is a full mix where everything is uh you know mixed together you know from analog tape and sequencers like 30 years ago way back when Uh, spectral layers will also allow you to, you know, find no noise profiles and be able to remove noise or be able to remove, like, you know, tracks that are bleeding through during the recording process. So we'll come over and let's say as we listen to this. Um, Tell me if you're educated. Don't you know you graduated last September. Don't so we're going to take the bass out. So let's say I wanted to do like a tempo detection of this file and add a delay on the reverb. Um, I could come directly over here, let's do our tempo detection. All right, and we have a pickup note. Let's say at the beginning. Let so I'm going to just come right over here. And then we, I could just drag the vocal file in. So now if we come over again, I'll just unmix the layers here, unmix stems.
parts. There's a lot of kind of AI functionality inside of spectral ears to be able to do this type of functions. All right, so I'm gonna drag the vocals file out and put it in kind of a project here. So let's take a listen to it. Let me let you know what I'm about and what it So if we wanted to just be able to, you know, separate the vials, we could do that and add different processing on the vocal. So if we just come over here. So I'm going to now come over here. Let's just add a delay to the vocal. So like an eighth, like a slap back delay. So I'm just going to add an effects in. Let's say a mono delay. Let's make it like an eighth note. So now when I'm here, we could just. Would I walk alone to my own beat? And when we let me tell you lies about me. Let me tell you lies about my... So we could do all sorts of fun stuff like that. So Steinberg's already actively involved with that type of technology for AI, for separation and audio restoration. So. All right, wonderful to see Uno Memento, who's giving one a la, a la Coke pint for everyone. See Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. Thanks. It's always great when Michael's here. The virtual ice cream will start. And in the United States, we have Memorial Day, which is the kind of the unofficial start of summer. So ice cream is incredibly welcome, Michael. See, Heartbreak Time Machine says locking MIDI clips prior to a time warp is a huge thing to understand, especially if you're doing film sync. So, yeah, it's always good. Right, Gareth is happy to see Michael Teams on. Derek Gray says the MIDI lock info is huge for me. He'll be using that a lot. All right, uh, so we have a question. Um, how can I reset event volume to normal uh, without quickly selecting each section? I have it with different levels uh, at different section. So I'm not sure if it's, um, so you say event volume. So let's see if, so if we come here, let's say if we have different event volumes here. Okay, so let's see if we could do this. If we select all three um, and hit zero, let's see if that will reset. And I'll try one other avenue here. So it's good audio and um, remove volume curve. This may just be for Yeah, so, it, so I'm not sure if it's done this way. All right, so we'll try another method here. Okay, so let's say I have these three events. And I'm going to group these events together by hitting Control or Command plus the letter G. And let's see if now if we set our volume to zero, they all kind of increase. So you might have to do 
do them each independently. So let me see if I ungroup these together. Yeah, so it looks like they're still going to be treated kind of separately. So I'm just going to hit zero, enter, and then you get left and right arrows. Um, but let's see if there's maybe one other approach that we could take. All right, so let's. see let me just see if I move these no yeah so it looks like it might have to be done um, independently um, now if it's clip gain volume or if it's like where we have you know like with the blue line here that we could you know, if you wanted to get rid of that, what you could do is come over to audio and we'll just say remove volume curve and then we can remove it. But I think if it's going to be kind of clip based volume that you might have to do it independently. I, I'll, I could play around with it a little bit um, if you want to um, in for, to, for Tuesday's live stream and see if I can come up with a good answer for that. Sorry about that. Sorry, my cat has snuck in and think wants me to feed him so I'm gonna send my cat outside real quick so you don't have to hear him whining bear with me just for a second All right, sorry about that. All right, so let's move on to next question. All right, wonderful to see Graham Witcher on. Okay, we see, um, all right, just reading through comments. All right, so we have uh, Lesso Sai Music, so he's just saying uh, hello from Italy. Nice to see a live stream. Such a live stream for Cubasers. Yeah, we do it every pretty much every Tuesday and Friday. Um, all right, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg. What's your favorite Cubase trick that not a lot of people know of? Um, I guess one that's kind of, you know, there's a couple. One is, like, if we have, uh, like, a range selection on a particular event, we just snap on and off so say I have this if you hit I think it's um, control G we just make sure I'm in I forgot the keyboard shortcut but there is a uh, like a play selected range um, 
or I think it's a P, like maybe control P. So let's say I have a selected range here. So we can set the left and right locators by hitting P. And I think if you go Alt P, that will activate the loop and start playing it. So if I'm here and I just say, okay, I want to do this and hit Alt P or Option plus P. Now one other trick you could do is in Transport, if we go to uh, the locators, we could um, exchange the left and right locators. And if we have Cycle activated, we could just skip. So if you wanted to skip a part of the song before cutting it out, see if it is a good edit or a bad edit, you could put the left and right locators in reverse. But um, there could be a chance that every, everyone's like, I know that, you know. So sometimes it's hard to know what people don't know for me. So, but those are a couple of good tricks. Gareth uh, indicates that some exotic extended scales can spread over more than one octave, but it is indeed a rare situation. A workaround might be to combine two scales. So I think we're currently mono scale in Cubase, which I think the vast majority of music is. So. Okay, Michael Teams asks, uh, Cubase, howdy Greg, question. Just got tracks from a client and it is not in tune. He says it is in B flat, but it is somewhere between B and C. Uh, where to look for fix for this? And so generally when this happens, it's gonna be a sample rate issue. Um, so check the actual file. So if you just look at the files, if you select it and look at it on the particular uh, format here, like the sample rate, you could, actually see what the sample rate is of, of the project so you know generally if it's from 48 to 44.1 it's not quite a semitone it's kind of out of tune somewhere in between so make sure that your sample rate um you know it's, it, it's, it matches the sample rate of the audio files so if you're at 48k and they're doing you know, or if you're at 44.1 or 48K or vice versa, it's probably going to be a sample rate issue and not necessarily a tuning thing. So check that, Michael. See, Michael Teams was just asking our questions as for the guitarist on the chat. So I'm a bass player, so I'm, I'm kind of almost a guitarist. Uh, it says, do you record guitars in mono, in stereo, and why the choice? So generally, you know, most people I think would record the guitar as mono if you wanted to record, you know, like specific effects for amplifiers then you could record in stereo. Um, I know like typical setup, you know, um, and like Peter Frampton has this, whenever you see him perform, he has three cabinets. One, the cabinet in the middle is dry, not affected, and he'll have delays and reverbs in the cabinets on the outside. So if you, have, if you look at the cabinets going across the stage, cabinets one and three will have effects and two will be dry. So he'll record, you know, his a mono track of his dry channel and stereo tracks of two cabinets all together. So, and he'll record the two cabinets as a stereo file and the one as a single file. So you could do it either way. Um, if you were just recording kind of a direct guitar, like when I record my bass, I do everything in mono. Um, but if you're doing like different processing and you're capturing that in your amplifier or amplifiers, then you could record as stereo. All right, we see Graham Witcher uh, just echoing Michael's comments uh, of everyone to raise a glass to the excellent moderation of Jazz Dude and Agent K. And it says they continue to undertake to make the live stream the best on the web. Cheers. So, well, well said.
All right, so we see um, from Patrick just says the Atmos setup assistant crashes the window and Windows 11 and also crashes when opening projects that have used that function. Uh, but everything works fine on Windows 10 and Mac OS. Is this a known bug? I haven't tried it on Windows 11. I don't have a Windows 11 machine. Um, but I would check just to, you know, hold down. If, you know, when you start your Cubase, hold down Alt, Control, Shift right after starting the program and see if you delete the program preferences, if that makes a difference for you. Also, just make sure you have the latest version as well. So if you're running 1206, um, so I assume you're running 12 for Atmos support, but yeah, make sure that you are running 1206, but try to start with like a blank slate of preferences. See, on the stereo mono guitars, uh, John Costigan just mentions he always records his electric and mono through Countryman DI, and he uses a Jensen transformer into his Pro Junior and Vibrolux to reamp. FX is where the stereo begins. So. Tries Eternal says Spectral Layers 9 can make a vocal sound like it's straight out of the vocal proof booth. Sorry, chat field jumped on me. Let me find my spot. All right. Let's see, Terry Gray says he owns Spectralers Pro. We should really start using it. So, yeah, it's pretty amazing. All right, so we see uh, Patrick asks, um, is it possible to keep the routing and panning information when importing tracks from a Dolby Atmos project into another Dolby Atmos project? Um, so if you're doing, if you are, you know, if it's just taking your Dolby Atmos, you know, if you, you know, so if it's at the project level, if you come over and import tracks from project, um, you could, you know, all that will be carried over if you if you select everything um if it is working with you know an adm file that's been like the exported rendered file at that point um you know cubase doesn't import adm files but nuendo does but you could take the tracks from one project that's utilizing dolby atmos and import them into another project that is also utilizing dolby atmos using the import tracks from project All right, so we see uh, some Nala online TV says, thanks, Greg, I'm gonna learn more about spectral layers. All right, so Eclipse Sound Patches says, uh, asks, um, is it possible to retain different size of editor and mix console in the lower zone? Uh, mixer small and editor larger than mixer height wise without using workspaces um, so it's going to be a consistent height for the for the zone height here uh, and if you wanted to change uh, you would if you wanted independent heights for those it would have to be utilized through workspaces so it's just so that everything you know so that you don't start losing tracks when you go back and forth everything's kind of kept to a consistent uniform height here so, but if you wanted to have different heights uh, for editors, then workspaces would allow you to work to do that. All right, wonderful to see Grant Nicholas on the live stream. I'm glad you could make it today. Hope you're well. All right, so we have X Cubase X on, so glad you can make it. Uh, it says, evening, Greg. Thank you for these streams. Fantastic. Glad that they're helpful for, pe for people. Always happy to help. All 
All right, uh, we got Patrick who asks, uh, can you elaborate on Steinberg's policy regarding backwards compatibility? Uh, it is an argument I often hear when discussing feature requests online for future Cubase releases. Um, you know, we try to make it as much as possible where you could, you know, have functions uh, like in Cubase 12 that could be opened in earl earlier versions. Uh, but, you know, some functions like, you know, if you're doing Dolby Atmos in Cubase 12 that doesn't exist in earlier versions like Cubase 11 or 10, then, you know, that functionality won't be there. So whenever possible, you know, when they're doing a design decision, they're going to try to make it as backward compatible as possible, but they won't do it f to, you know, if it's a point where it's like, okay, you know, we have to, you know, we're, in we're introducing a new feature, you know, so at that point, we, you know, don't want to not introduce great functionality just because it may not work with Cubase 8.5 or Cubase 10. So, you know, but to the best of their abilities, you know, they try to make, you know, everything as backward compatible as possible. You know, we can still load projects from 2001 directly into Cubase. It's the same file format. So, you know, they're, you know, they work very, you know, they work, you know, hard to maintain that, but they don't want to do it at the expense of introducing new features and functionality that customers want. Okay, so we see uh, today's stream is top notch, learning tons from Heartbreak Time Machine. Thanks. Okay, so Gerald just says, okay, watch, you know, switching left and right locators for a test edit. Love it. And John Barry says, Cubase always did a reverse locator trick, only recently to become a feature with it, with it added to a menu. So, yeah, it's always, it's always done that, but a lot of people don't know about it. But, you know, we at least added the capability to reverse the locator so you wouldn't have to do it manually. So that was uh, added, I think, in 10. So a lot of people would accidentally reverse their locators and they couldn't. It's like, why can't I export? Because if you had the uh, locators reversed, you you know it wouldn't allow you to export since it was kind of exporting negative time. So that's when they just came up with uh, under transport to locators to exchange the left and right locators. But yeah, the function's been in Cubase for a long time. And Kara says, uh, to, get re to get reverse locators, you only have to go 88 miles per hour. So that's a good point. So I'll have to mention that to Alan Silvestri next time I talk to him. All right, um, so we see question. Uh, do you have a favorite setting color-wise for your channel meter settings? And do you find any of the optional master channel metering options useful, not including LUFs, et cetera? You know, so if you're, let's say you're, you know, you're looking at the master meter here. You know, so I usually use the default meters uh, and I usually have it to, you know, to digital scale, it's just kind of what I'm kind of used to looking at, you know, uh, you know, some people I know will always have, you know, like K20 on, you know, which is kind of for more dynamic music, you know, so, you know, so using kind of the cat system meterings. So they're, they're really there to just kind of give you, you know, if there's a particular metering choice that you're used to, you know, Cubase can allow you to do that and allows you to switch back and forth seamlessly to make sure that it's going to, you know, be accurately conveyed to the different metering types. I usually keep the default metering colors. Um, I remember one time I was in Nashville and I think in the same day, I was at Michael Wagner, who's who was on one of our previous uh, Zoom meetups, uh, who's really known for hard rock stuff. And then I went from Michael Wagner's to Gary Pachosa, who's like, you know, almost the complete antithesis of, you know, really super pure Americana, acoustic, you know, Alison Krauss, Dixie Chicks. 
uh, you know, that type of super squeaky clean stuff. And, you know, both of them had mentioned to me, it was just as an aside, and it was on the same day, so that, you know, the time that they used to, you know, like when they have downtime in the studio, and they used to rewind tape in the old days, and that would give the engineer like a little 30-second mental vacation. And like if someone is not getting the vocals right, that both of them to pass time would just come over to their preferences. And both of them were like, yeah, when I'm bored and someone's not getting their part right, I just come over here and I make different meter colors. And that was kind of like their hobby to try to come up with cool meter colors. I, I think the default meter colors work really well and make a lot of sense. But if you really wanted to customize them, so, you know, at, at minus six, you want it to be hard red, you know, you could do that pretty easily. I personally tend to use kind of default modes, um, but that's, you know, just me, so... All right, wonderful to see Pablo on today. We had a full hot mess group. That's always wonderful. So glad you can make it. Everyone's always happy when Pablo is here. Michael Team says, cool, thanks, Greg. A great explanation of Peter's rig. Yeah, so, yeah, Peter is a total, you know, uh, has, you know, just such a great setup. And he's, you know, he's a guy that sits there and tries every combination and, uh, you know, using uh, British amps with different, like, you know, power converters and stuff like that. You know, but yeah, it, make, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Okay, so we have a question from Best Screen Jesus. Uh, Greg, is there a way to drag multiple samples onto Groove Agent once so that they aren't sequentially, uh, so they insert sequentially and not stacked, uh, like an alt or shift drag? All right, so let's take a look. So it really matters kind of what the, um, when you see like the little dots as you kind of carry them onto a pad. So let's come here to Groove Agent SE. I will go to um, a number of different samples here. Let me just all right. So as we come over here, let's get to media and all right. So if I wanted to take all of these. Um, so when I drag it and we see, I put it onto where we have one square. Now all of those samples are mapped to the same, to the same pad. Um, so if we do it like that, so that's when we have one square. So if I come here and drag them where we see three squares, then each sample is mapped sequentially. And where you see two squares, that will replace an existing sample that's on the pad. So try just coming over here, uh, select a number of samples, and then go with not one, but two, but three dots, and then they'll all be mapped to individual pads. So let me know if that's what you want to do, Best Screen Jesus, and glad that you can make it today. Gareth just says things need to be backward compatible for his brain. So, all right. Wonderful to see Lawrence Koch from Rhode Island. All right, Soren is smashing the like button at number 70. Wonderful to see Jean-Marie Horvat. So always so great to see Jean-Marie. Does amazing work. Everyone Google Jean-Marie. All right. Um, 
So we see from Gerald Ely, I think this is with the left and right locators. He just says, uh, in a contextual menu brings up the reverse option. I used to do it manually, but didn't know what I could do with it. Okay, so we see Dalski asks, uh, hi Greg, my reverb tail is not going smooth. Uh, it's stuttering at the fade. What could this be? All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can find a project here where we get an idea. Just do a different one. All right, so I'm not sure what um, what reverb you're using with it, but let's go ahead and with this, I'm going to uh, let's go to our sends. So here I'm just going to have a revelation reverb. And I'll just go ahead and solo the track. What did you say? You wish and I'll just kind of make it a larger room. And I'm left here for a thousand years and a day. So, you know, one thing that it might be if you have like Dynamics plugins on it um, and, you know, maybe they're set to post fader that, you know, you know, check to make sure that you don't have maybe uh, a compressor or something after the signal flow. Like if we have this going to a group, so let's say I have, um, like that going to a group. And then let's say if you have a compressor on the group, so let's say as we play this, or let's say we come to this group and you know, if you have a gate, Let's say maybe being a, we have some spaces here. What did you say? Or maybe you a compressor that's all away. And I'm left here for a thousand years and a day. You were the party, the big I was your everything. I just tried the beginning. We have a little more space. What did you say? You so it could be other plugins that are maybe taking the reverb tail and then, you know, cutting the reverb tail through like different dynamics processing. You know, so make sure that that's not the case, you know, um, but it sounds pretty smooth. So in, I'm not sure if it's a particular reverb. Sometimes people will put uh, like a gated reverb on it where it's intended like for drums to get a lot of excitement and then cut off. So it doesn't kind of continue onward uh, and take up space in the mix. But if you let us know like which reverb you're using and if there's any kind of dynamics processing on it afterwards. All right, great to see um, Spike Williams from Rhonda Wales. We have Jovanovic 3D who asked, uh, 
Okay, so we see, uh, how do I force Cubase to hold on my UI color scheme in preferences? It always changes some weird approximation when I restart Cubase. Um, so I'm not sure if it's the colors, um, you know, that, that are doing it, um, if it's the colors or color scheme, but one of the things you could always try to do, like if you're starting from kind of a known starting point, is maybe to you know save a template and generally all those different aspects will be recalled in a template so if you could let us know if you're using templates or not or if that fits your workflow see spike williams had the same point all right so we see best screen jesus says yes thank you that was it good Spike Williams is like number 75. All right. And if you got free ice cream, you had to give a like. So, see, Pablo is requesting ice cream. He's holding out his like for Michael Team's ice cream. All right, so we see Patrick uh, asks, um, are there any plans to add native uh, MS to Nuendo? I also own WaveLab Pro, but I'm not aware of a built-in workflows allow me to uh, mid-side process, uh, but I'm not aware of any built-in mid -flow, uh, workflows allow me to mid-size process in WaveLab and then get the audio back to Nuendo again. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll just jump back. So let's say I wanna take, um, that one file that we were playing around with. All right. I'll just create a new file. Okay, so I'm just gonna bounce this selection just in case I mess everything up. All right, so I want to take this file here and I'm gonna take it into WaveLab. So we'll say audio uh, edit in WaveLab. All right, and let's say at this point, I wanna switch it to my mid side and I wanted to just increase the volume so I'll process here and I'm gonna add let's say gain I'm gonna add 6 dB to the sides so now we listen to this um, And now what I want to do is to just take um, so I think if I come here to edit, um, there's the way to send it back to Nuendo. Um, okay, so I'm going to trigger this Cubase Nuendo update. All right, so I'm going to put a new track version. All right, so just as a reference point. All right, so now I'll go back to WaveLab and let's trigger the update. So once I'm here, and then you could just trigger the update. So make sure that once you've done it in WaveLab, that you choose to then uh, trigger the Cubase Nuendo update, and then the process that you do in WaveLab is automatically sent right back to where you were. So give that a shot. Okay, exit out of Wave Lab. All 
sorry. Wonderful to see Pablo on saying hello to me. Hope you're doing well. Look forward to hearing your drum parts. All right, we see Bruce has to go save someone from a bee sting. Um, Okay, so we have a question from the Heartbreak Time Machine. It says, uh, if I send a channel to a group and have a plugin on that group channel, does pre-post uh, affect the signal from the source channel? All right, so let's go ahead and I'll just take... All right, let me just... find a particular file that we could play around with for this. Okay, I'll just go here. We'll play with some vocals. Okay, so let's say we have some vocals. I will mute that. All right, now I'll mute. Let's say we we'll just have. Okay, so uh, if I send a channel to a group and have a plug in on our group channel, does pre post affect uh, the signal from the source channel? Okay, so I'm going to add this to a group channel. So now we'll have both of these playing. Uh, 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 uh. All right, and let's put, I'm not sure if you're, um, put a plug-in on a group channel. So let's say we'll put um, something obvious. I'm not sure if you're doing insert or send, but we'll do like a flanger just so we know. It should be pretty easy to hear. I started losing sight of play. Okay. Uh, so it says if I send a channel to a group, then the plug in on that group channel, does pre post affect the signal from the source channel? Um, so this is what I mentioned. Am I in? So the post, let's do pre. Mention am I in? Um, does a pre plugin pre post affect the signal chain? So, um, but let me just try. So it didn't seem to make a difference with the, uh, flanger. And I think when it makes a difference is, you know, when do we, uh, 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 uh. I'll come here to the vocal. So we have, I started losing sight of place. and now when I go to the fader, Yeah, let's go to the group and we'll make it post in fader. Air. In the air. So it doesn't seem to make an effect. Let's try it with ascend. So I'll turn off the flanger and on the group we'll put um, as ascend a reverb. All right, so now we go to our group channel. What dimension am I in? And let's move this to pre fader. In the end. To post fader. In the end. And we'll, and we'll 
we'll go to the send here. So let's say, I feel the I'll send this to the stereo out, and let's say if I send it to the group. Oh, oh, I started losing sight. And we'll move this to post fader, or to pre fader. Rather. What dimension am I in? So it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference to me. So, but let me know if that if I'm approaching it correctly. Okay. Pablo says he's going to show me drums, drums, drums. It's great. Look forward to hearing him. All right, we see Pablo has to go, and once I wish everyone a great weekend. All right, um, so we see, uh, hello, Greg, uh, greetings from Finland. Question, uh, when I duplicate a track, the name of the duplicated track uh, will be the original plus the letter uh, bracket D bracket. Uh, can this additional lettering be disabled? Um, so it's gonna. That's you know. That's gonna be the way that it's going to indicate that a track was duplicated. So if we do that. We see that this little extension on the track. Now, if you want to get rid of that name, we can make. Um, you know, you could go to like a project logical editor. So let's say I want to take. Um, just come over, start from scratch. So we want to choose to transform. Let's say I want to take media type is, or we'll say container type is um, track. And, and what I want to do is go to name and let's, um, Let's see, um, replace, and we'll do, and then we'll just replace it. All right, let's see what the, so we hit apply, I think we can, all right, it's going to, So let's try generate name. Then I just want to see what that does. No. All right, I know there's a way of doing this. Let me just find the right variable here. We'll say erase after the bracket. So we see vocal bracket D bracket. Okay. see if this does it yeah so um i know i know you know so it's just to distinguish when we have a track that was duplicated so you could you know know when that is so just come over to transform and we want to say container type is equal to track and then you could just say name uh, and then replace search string and then type in the you know bracket 
you know, capital D bracket, and then that will automatically replace it. So you could assign that to a keyboard shortcut. And, you know, anytime that you've duplicated a track, you could just say, okay, get rid of that without having to go through and retype. And you could do that for, you know, multiply selected files. So let's say if we duplicate all these tracks, So we'll just come here. So we have a number of tracks kind of meeting that criteria that we could go to our project logical editor. And that will get rid of them, all, all of the tracks that have that particular naming convention applied to it. So, but there's no, you know, but it kind of adds it to indicate that it is duplicated. So. All right, so Gary says Wave Lab is fab. All right, so we see um, Alfred asks, uh, is there a way to select a particular lane without the mouse, like a key command or a MIDI command? I would just like to be able to compare different takes while the track is on a loop. Okay, so let's see if we can find a way of doing that. Right, so let's say we have just a bass part here. And we have these in lanes. Just go to my All right, so say if we have a lane selected. Okay, so let's say we have So obviously we could come here and just switch between our different takes here. See if there's any we just look for any key commands for lanes. I don't know of a way to do it off the top of my head, but we'll see if there's maybe a function for auditioning lanes. See, I don't know of a function um, to do that. So if I'm here, I could let me just check one other preference. Let's see if this makes any difference. Yeah, 
Yes, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know of a way to do it without the mouse. Um, I'll pass that along as kind of a feature suggestion. Um, but if you don't have the lanes visible here, let's see if if we just click. See if I have if I have the comp tool open. Doesn't change the behavior. Let me check one other preference. Let's see if the track selection follows event selection. Yeah, so I think it's manually with the mouse. Um, I'll play around with it a little more and see if I come up with anything for Tuesday's live stream. Sorry about that. Um, but it's usually pretty easy just to, you know, click with the object, so, you know, with the with the comping tool to select back and forth. Um, I guess one thing you could do is if you wanted to select the lanes as a workaround, that's probably not a great workaround, but you could say, let's, um, you could say convert, uh, create tracks from lanes, and then you could solo, you know, the if you wanted to at this point, solo. And let's set my preference here. So if these are all so say from here and then I navigate down I could just use my up down arrow keys as tracks but not as lanes so quickly if you wanted to just go back and forth between it to audition um, just create tracks from lanes and then you could uh, audition just by using kind of the arrow keys to navigate up and down. All right. Okay, so we see from the Heartbreak Time Machine says, uh, I guess this is with the groups, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out, uh, and when the group fader is affecting the send to the effects plugin or the return from the effects, in this case, East West Space is uh, trying to fit my orchestra, you know, quote unquote, in the space. So, yeah, you know, play around with it. I don't have that plugin to kind of test, you know, but it could depend on the actual reverb plugin itself, how it's going to uh, react to the changes. All right, Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button so I could be gainfully employed. I like being gainfully employed, so please hit this the like button. All right. All right, so Gareth is going to feed his daughter. And he's just saying thanks for another perfect hangout. Uh, it says, sorry for my even more stupid than usual questions. No stupid questions, so, but... Uh, my one thing I learned is that there are different scales for different octaves. So, didn't know that. All right. Say hi to Lola for us. All right. You see, thanks for the duplicate problem naming solution. Um, then I just see from uh, YT. Uh, Beber just saying, or Beber just says a race after the space. Yeah. So uh, with that, with that particular one, if like let's say if I had um, this track, and I said a race after the space, at that point it may erase like 
after 04. So let's go take a look at it. Um, so we're going to go to our project logical editor and we say name and then we can say replace. Um, we say erase. Um, race after space so if we have something like that that we could so it could you know if there is a space in the names um, you might erase um, you know just unwanted stuff instead of just a particular characters of the bracket capital D bracket All right, so we have a question from Michael who asks, uh, does anything get linked when you duplicate a track, i.e. you change the original and the duplicate changes automatically? So they're not linked necessarily, uh, but it will duplicate the track in the current state that it is when it, when it is duplicated. So it's not going to automatically be linked. Um, you can link, you know, or group different channels together. So... But the duplication is not necessarily contingent upon that. So let's say if I want it to this point, I'll revert. So if you wanted to kind of, you know, link channels, we can say, okay, I want to take these and just hit control or command plus G. And then if I do a fade in, it'll do it on both. If I make a cut on the top one, it's going to do it on both. I move this in, then it, those those events will be linked. So any changes that I make will automatically carry over. But just because it's duplicated doesn't immediately link it to the track it was duplicated from. But if you select both of them and then choose to do... Uh, group editing on them, then the different parameters can be linked. All right. Okay, so we see uh, from uh, there was a toggle lane active in key command. So let's take a look at that. Okay, we'll give that a try. So let's come over, we'll go back. Okay, so let's set up um, a MIDI remote just to do this. All right. Okay, so now I'll make sure I have that assigned correctly. All right, so that's a process. Um, let me just try it's a project logical editor.
All right, so maybe we could try it through Project Logical Editor, so. Yeah, so I, I see it there. I don't think it I don't think it's gonna do what we want, but we'll take a quick look at it. See if we get open it up again here quickly. Yeah, so that's going to open it up there. Let me just, that will turn on the lane. Yeah, so I don't think that there's a way to do that, but um, I'll play, I'll continue to play around with it some more over the weekend and see if I come up with anything for Tuesday's live stream. Okay, uh, so you see, Patrick, uh, is there a key command to rename the selected track instead of clicking on the name? Okay, so let's see if there's a key command for it. Okay, under edit. Um, okay, so rename first selected track. I'm not sure if this is, um, so option shift R. Yeah, so you could just uh, so option shift R, so there's a rename first selected track. So if you have this selected, and I'm not sure if that's the default key command, but option shift R. Another thing you could do if you are naming tracks uh, quickly, like if you have like, you know, 20 drum tracks to name, if you type in a name and then hit the tab key, that will automatically activate the name field for you to type. So as you hit the tab key, I could just continue to say, okay, I'm here. So command shift R, we could rename the track tab, and that will take you to name the next selected track like that. So if you're naming multiple tracks, hitting the tab key is a, a great tip. All right, wonderful to see uh, Dean Nyack. Thanks for joining us, saying hello. See the Heartbreak Time Machine says, uh, thank you so much for today and for every day's stream. Uh, I've come so far in Cubase because of this. It's wonderful, thanks. It always makes me feel like I've been helpful and it's help it makes me feel good, thank you. All right, so Michael Teams has a question about the tracks being out of tune. So he says, uh, it was sent to me at 44.1K and he works at 48K, so. All right, wonderful to see David M from Liverpool on. All 
All right. Uh, so we see Gerald Ely asks. Um, says, uh, I made a global MIDI remote map for a particular VST. The map works fine in the project I created it in, uh, but not in other projects. The map comes up, but all items are marked missing. Uh, Mac Cubase 12. Okay, so um, let me know if you, how you made um okay so um okay so there's a couple ways of doing this for like a vst so let's say if i have a vst instrument open i'll do something like retro log so i'm not sure if it's with the uh, like quick controls that you've done here. Um, so where you're doing focused quick controls, so you could have those kind of mapped. Or if um, you went through, let's say a MIDI remote layer here. So say, okay, I want to have like these particular functions. Uh, so, you know, what you could do is, let's say if we go to the mapping assistant here, uh, and if we say, let's make a new page. So we'll just say, we'll call it Gerald. Um, and now if we, are, we have an instrument open, and let's say I open the instrument this time instead. And I start assigning different functions here. So let's say I right click, um, will allow for MIDI editing. I move the slider, we apply the mapping. And let's say, okay, I come here and pick up for MIDI remote. I want that knob, we'll apply the mapping, uh, pick up for MIDI remote. So I move this fader and now it's applied. So now these three parameters, once I close this out, those three knobs, as I move them, will control the, you know, the various parameters here. So did you make a, a new MIDI mapping page for it, Gerald, or did you do it, um, so, and I'm also not sure if you did it from like the remote control editor here where we could set up kind of banks of eight parameters. Um, and then once this is done, you could save this as, you know, a particular layout and this will be carried over with the particular plugin. So if you could let me know how you did the MIDI mapping, if it was in a new MIDI remote, that would be helpful. All right, Esteban Carlos Benson asks, uh, when routing MIDI from a MIDI track to a VST track, um, can that be done with the MIDI output routing or is MIDI send the only way to do that? Okay, so if we, uh, you know, so let's say I have a MIDI track here. Okay, so it's just a regular MIDI track, not an instrument track and I want to route uh, this MIDI track here to go to, let's say, this instrument. So let's say we have uh, Retrolog, and we'll just go to Quick Preset. All right, so now uh, I will take this MIDI track and I could just set the output here. I think we'll see the retro log. Let's see if it shows up here. So we could just route this particular track uh, to retro log. So you don't have to use a MIDI send. Um, when you go to add, let's say an instrument in the rack. So let's say, okay, I'm here and I have pad shop. So we'll often get asked by default, do you want to create a MIDI track assigned to Pad Shop? And now we could just come over here and be able to access those particular instruments. Let me just check my audio connections quickly. Yeah, 
So now we could have our pad shop track and this MIDI track um, that was routed to Retrolog. I could come over here and so you don't have to use MIDI sends. You could just take the MIDI output and route it to whatever instruments that you want directly from there. All right, so we see David M. sending a big hi to Michael Teams, Graham Witcher, and Gerald Ely. All right, hope we see you on the Tuesday Zoom meetup, and I'll provide the link on Tuesday for that during the live stream. Okay, so uh, Gerald Ely just indicated that um, he used the mapping assistant and made a new page. So make sure that when you're there, you know, because sometimes it may default to the first one, and just make sure that you have that particular mapping page selected right there. Um, so see if that is, you know, that the controller is routed to the same mapping page. And if it's an instrument, also that you know may have different functions like let's say if it's in Halion and you have a, a wavetable instrument and then you load up an FM like an FM labs preset you know like you know like a different instrument with different parameters that that may not carry over so depending on the instrument if it's dynamically allocating what particular functions and capabilities are currently in the instrument per the particular patch that could also have an effect on it Gerald he says you made a default mapping for controlling Cubase and that comes up in every project um, yes yeah, so, you know make sure that when you go to you know your mapping assistant here that everything like when you double click that it's showing up kind of as expected right there with all the assignments and you know I'm not sure if you um, but you know make sure that all the assignments are there and see if you maybe go to a different assignment if that is um, you know if those parameters look like they're loaded as well All right, so I know I had a couple of questions that were mailed in. Let me get to those. Now everyone's looking forward in the U.S. to holiday weekend. I think it's a holiday weekend in Germany as well for Monday. So I think we have lots of people. I'm probably the only one working in my company, it seems like, on a Friday afternoon. All right, so let's go ahead and get to some of the questions. All right, um, so we had a question, uh, how to restore, this came up in the last live stream, was uh, how to restore uh, a missing eighth note quantized preset. So someone had noticed when they went to the MIDI drum editor that uh, when they came here to the drum editor that they went to the presets and they didn't have an eighth note uh as a preset which is a pretty common quantize so what you could do if that happens is just come over to the quantize panel and where we see our presets um so click there and then you could choose to restore factory presets and then the eighth note should appear directly there so once again too if you're missing a particular uh, quantize parameter or value come over to the quantize panel and then click in the preset list and then click on restore factory presets all right okay so we see a question on uh, how to set up controllers uh, how to set up two controllers use one controller for audio and one for groups okay so if we wanted to set something like that up 
So let's say I have two controllers. Let's say I want to use um, my choice OS controller for groups and this for audio and instruments, my nano control. So we'll do a new project. We'll come over here, we'll create empty. And I'll just add 24 audio tracks. And we'll do eight group tracks. Okay, so I'll just add groups. Okay, so we have, so what I want to do is maybe just, we'll go to my choice OS controller and I want this to control the volumes of my group channels. So I'm going to go to the mixer. Let's find my group channel. So let's say my first group channel and I'm going to right click and pick up for MIDI mapping. I'm going to select my choice OS controller here. We'll do the first fader and let's apply the mapping. I'll go to the second and I'll move the fader. Let's go to the second fader here, pick up for MIDI remote, apply. Let's go to fader three, pick up for MIDI remote apply and let's pick up MIDI remote here so just right click all right so we'll do six Seven, so I'll just assign these quickly. And we'll get an eight. All right, so now my choice sauce controller, when I close this, will just control all of my groups. And it's not gonna do anything else. All right, so I want to control my, uh, let's say my channels here. Uh, I'm gonna go to my Korg Nano control. So we'll just jump back, say our nano control, and I want to go to the preset, and I have this, there's just kind of a default preset mapping page here, where you say, let's go to mixer, and now each of my eight channels will, con I have my eight faders here, this is gonna control my mixer, and I have bank buttons. So if I wanted to go to my mix console, I could have my controller here, and this is controlling all of my channels. All right, and then I hit the bank button. This is now channels nine through 16. So we could just come over here, and as I grab my choice OS controller, I can move. So we go to the MIDI remote, I move that and we go to the mix console. Now my choice OS controller is directly controlling only the group. So you can split out multiple MIDI remote controllers to do different functions for you like that. All right, so we had a question. Uh, hi, Greg, uh, please, can you clarify pre-listening of drum samples in GrooveVision 2? There's no way for me to use it and that would be so practical to create my own original drum kits. Okay, so let's take a look. All right, let me just jump to this project. All right, so let's say I have um, this particular kit. And let me just play a particular pattern here. Okay, so let's say I wanted to now take this particular kit. Um, let's 
So let's say I want to take the snare drum here. And I wanted to take, and I guess what they want to do is to maybe audition different snare drums while that's playing. So we're going to go to the folder icon. And I'll just turn this down just a little bit. All right, so I have that pad selected and I say let's go to instruments and I want to go to snare drums. So while it's playing, um, I'll just say, okay, let's just double click. And you could just audition through different samples. So you could just go through and your Groove Agent Kit. And if you want to go to your browser, you could come over here and say, okay, I want to go to my computer and navigate. So let's go to documents. Now to say, okay, we'll come over here to projects. And I think I have some snare samples that I could just drop in. So, so let's go to uh, so here if I just want to or if I want to play a loop So here you could just kind of uh, audition through any samples that you have in your system. Okay, uh, so we have another question. Um, just out of curiosity, any feedback on Cubase featuring artificial intelligence for uh, for a next future? So you know, there's you know, there's you know, it really could depend on like what your definition of artificial intelligence is you know we could say okay artificial intelligence is taking your chords you know developing a chord track from digital audio it is coming up with you know different uh you know sounds in synthesis engines inside of howling in sonic or you know there's a lot of artificial intelligence for sound design in pad shop um so you know there's a lot of stuff that could be deemed artificial intelligence i don't think we will in the next version if i were to speculate say okay you know make me a hip-hop track at 104 beats a minute and hit a button and have it spit out you know which would probably be the same track that everyone else who asked the same criteria would would get um so but there's a lot of functionality inside of like spectral layers that's based on artificial intelligence for extracting different elements and and you know doing spectral editing is a good spot for that so there's a lot of stuff that's already been we haven't touted it as artificial intelligence but you know by definition you could um so there's a lot you know the chord track you know being able to generate harmony voices that would be you know by definition pretty much artificial intelligence where you know you could tell chords and take a vocal and have it generate, you know, different parts or have it generate chords that fit musically uh, or chords that will fit uh, within different, um, you know, chords that will fit within, you know, different genres and stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff, you know, using the scale assistant in a MIDI editor. So, so it could really depend on what your perception of artificial intelligence is as well. All right, so let's go back to our live questions. I just had a, I saw an email come in real quick. Let me see if it's if it's a question. All right. All right, so I'll just move back to our live questions. Thanks for all the great questions from everyone.
All right, so we see from Uno Memento, do we have a Zoom meetup someday? So it'll be Tuesday, starting at like two hours into the live stream. Uh, so it'll be 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. So, and we'll give, and we will have a special guest. Um, so hang on just one sec. Someone who's been probably in the music industry 50 years, worked with, you know, so many legends. So, and we'll... Uh, uh, we see David M's not going to be able to make it for the Zoom meetup. We'll miss having you there. All right. All right. So we see uh, Michael Teams just says uh, how to delete a project in Cubase. You know, so once you have the project, you could go to your Windows Explorer or not your web browser. Sorry that might mess up all right so if you just come over here to your documents um and then if we say okay i want to go to uh my projects you know it's going to be really just deleting you know your particular project folder here if you want to delete it from showing up like in your hub you could you know so if you don't want to see it coming up here i think you could just uh right click and delete or remove from list so you could do it if you know if you have like 16 uh, variations that you want to get rid of you could just simply come over there and delete or rename or remove it from this particular list that comes up so let me know if that's helpful for you michael um so we see, uh, hi Greg, just wondering if you uh, received my email I sent at the last live stream. It was about remove unused media. You mentioned that you had problems with the email. Should I resend it? So if you want to just ask the question in the chat field, um, if possible, um, you know that would you know that would be fine. For some reason, it seems like the last maybe ten days or so or two weeks, um, I haven't figured out exactly when. It seemed like my you know because it, it's an email address that i'm not a steinberg employee so to do this they created an email address of the club cubase at steinberg.de and that forwards to my work email and i haven't been able to and it doesn't seem like that forwarding is working and i've tried to reach out to a couple people but they, i think there's a lot of people on holiday this weekend that could resolve it so hopefully next week but if you have the uh particular um you know, if you have the, you know, feel free to ask the question in the, uh, in the chat field. All right, so we see uh, from Gerald Ely just saying the VSTs, the IK multimedia, this is with the uh, mapping parameters not carried over. Uh, it says the map shows up, but the controller knobs have the word missing underneath instead of a signed item. I did move to a new computer. Maybe I left something. Yeah, it could be. Um, yeah, so, so check that um, and, you know, let me know, um, you know, if you still have problems with it on Tuesday. Okay, uh, so we see how do I join the Zoom? When do we get the, it says Ling. Uh so it'll be Tuesday, and generally what we do is we go like a, an abbreviated hangout. So we'll go for two hours, and then two hours of Zoom after that. So and we'll give the um, you know we'll give the the Zoom link uh, in the meeting on Tuesday. So you could look for it on Tuesday's meeting. Okay. You see, John Barry says, ah, baby, that's why you didn't get my email last week. So, yeah, that, that's probably why. So, hopefully it'll get resolved soon. Um, all right, so we see, um, is there a shortcut to jump to the end of a track? Um, let me just take a quick look. So, I know we could hit the period key on a numeric keypad to go to the beginning of the project, but let me just check the key commands and see if there's one that 
jumps out. So I'll just type it in here and So there's a, uh, you'll see a key command here for go to project end. So you could just set a key command uh, directly there. So if I wanted to set that in my, um, all right, so let's say if I have this, I'm going to assign it into, so this will probably be the end of the project here. Let's assign it into my MIDI remote. Let's say this button and we'll say go to project end. I'm going to assign that function. Okay. So now when I hit the button, it'll just take us to the end of the project. I hit the period key on the numeric keypad, that'll take us to the end. Or so the period key on the numeric keypad will take us directly to the beginning and then you could assign the project end which would take you to the last event in the project. So even if we had a larger project, something that looked like this, So now, so if I'm in the middle of the project, I could hit that key command to go that function in the MIDI remote to go to the end of the project and the period key to go to the beginning. Okay. All right, um, all right, so you see Gerald Ely won't be able to make it to the Zoom meeting, but he might be able to show up late. So hopefully you could make it. Uh, look forward to seeing you if you are late. All right, um, so we see, will Spectralayers Pro work on Cubase 10 Pro? Let me just take a quick look um, and see if that had it, if when a ARA2 is added, Um, so it looks like it was added in 10.03, so you should be able to to work with ARA2. I, I just didn't remember which version of Cubase had added it, so I just looked it up real quick. But it looks like uh, within the 10.0 lifecycle that there is ARA uh, handling, so you should be able to run it. The later versions will have some you know deeper integration with that. Okay, so we see uh, Patrick was just saying, uh, the question was just me following up with a question about the remove unused media and save as function with a few examples for the developer team. I guess I'll just resend it in a couple of days. You know, feel free to ask it in the live stream here if you want. Okay, so we see um, question. Um, Sometimes when rendering several events in place in one go, some events come out empty. Is this a bug or is it something wrong uh, in my render in place settings? Um, so usually when something comes out empty uh, and I've done a render in place. So let me just go here to this. So usually when something comes out empty, it could be that the track uh, was recorded and enabled. So if I do this and I say, let's render in place. 
we'll go to our render setting. So that's record enabled. They say, let's make separate events. I hit render and thinking, okay, I'm doing everything wonderfully well. And as we do this, um, so some of the events may, you know, so make sure that you don't have like, you know, some of the tracks, you know, so as we did this, um, so I'm going to undo my render in place again. So let's say, you know, but make sure you don't have it record enabled because that could just, let me just get my keyboard to the right computer. So, but if we do this, you know, so make sure that you don't have something record enabled. So if we come and say, okay, I want to make this with my channel settings, we can now come over and all the events will be rendered uh, appropriately. So, so make sure that you don't have like a track record enabled or, and that could have an effect on it. Then I just see, um, all right, we see Tiago joining us. Thanks for being on. Um, so we see uh, also the question on the render place is it just happened to me and I restarted Cubase and that worked. So it could be, again, the status of if the track was selected that you're, you know, maybe it automatically armed the track for record. So check that. All right, um, so we see, um, I use Scarlet 2i2. Question, uh, what major advantage will using the control room instead of stereo out since 2i2 has one left and right output? All right, so like the big difference is going to be um, that you could decouple, you know, the, you know, many people use the master fader of their, of their mixer, their software mixer for their volume control. And that's often not kind of the most ideal situation. So, so I'll just open up a quick project here. So just like a real kind of, you know, you know, professional mixing console, we're going to have a control room stage. And most software, you know, doesn't really offer this. So when we come here, let's say we're playing back uh, our project. So let's say if I had um, powered speakers and I was using this for my master output volume, that if I exported it because my speakers, maybe their volume was up, at this point it's going to drop the volume level of my exported file because I'm telling it to drop it down by minus, you know, 26 dB. When I go to my control room, I could adjust the monitoring level without having to adjust the gain structure of my final mix. So I could just come over here and I could decouple the actual, um, I could decouple the volume change or the volume from the gain structure of the mix. Now I also have down mix presets. So you can say, okay, I wanna to listen to this and see how it sounds in mono make sure it's going to fold down correctly so I could just go back and forth between stereo listen to it in stereo listen to it in mono now we could also set kind of different so if I wanted to dim the volume we could do that but we could also set kind of like a known reference point so we say this is the loudest that I want to be mixing at I could hold down Alt or Option and just set my value there so I could go right back to a known mixing level. So sometimes people, as they're mixing, they just kind of keep creeping the volume up and up and up and up. And I, I remember working with Phil Ramone and he was kind of like a big proponent of this. Uh, he's like, okay, you know, from the very first part of the session, you know, it never gets louder than this point. And he would, you know, put a piece of tape there on the control room 
so that as the session goes on that you don't kind of wear your ears out. So you have kind of a known level. Now, one of the other things that this is going to allow you to do is while you're mixing to use something called a listen bus. So even if you had just a stereo output, uh, we could solo tracks. So if I wanted to solo the vocal or the strings, everything is muted. But if I wanted to hear that kind of in context, like the vocal, I could hit the L button. And now the other tracks the outside, can just be dimmed in. down. You put the close side up on your heart. The so without having to solo tracks, it got dark. Where do I go from here? this way I could just Where dim the other tracks. Where do I go from here? I'm so now I hear it in context. Hey. Now this also kind of goes on for effects because a lot of times when we solo effects channels, so now I solo the effects channel and we see that the source track is also soloed because it's in the signal path with the reverb. But if I wanted to just isolate the reverb by itself, I could just click on the L. And now I'm only listening to the reverb, so I could choose to EQ the reverb here independently. So I could isolate just the reverb. And so those are just a couple of the things that you could do if you have just a two in, two out audio interface while using, um, you know, just the control room. So there are a lot of benefits of it. Okay, let me just read through questions. Um, so John Barry just says, uh, hi Greg, would just like to thank you for helping answering our questions, but for me, they also help me to find answers and solutions by myself too, so thank you again. So thank you very much, John, that's very kind words. I appreciate that. All right, so we see uh, Patrick just ask, uh, the feature request was about saving different versions of a project and still being able to remove unused media without losing audio files used in previous saves, uh, but you answered it last time. Okay, yeah, so I remembered that. Um, so I think that, you know, and I think my point was that, you know, saving a project, um, you know, saving a particular project and making a, a change to media files, you know, should only affect that particular project and shouldn't also affect other projects. And I think that makes sense. All right, so we see a question from Tiago. Uh, some plugins do not bypass correctly. They keep processing the audio. Uh, only when I disable them, the audio is not processed. It happens with only two third-party plugins. Is that the plugin's fault? So I, I would tend to think that, it, you know, it would, if it's only happening with those two plugins, that maybe it's a coding issue. I'm not a software developer, but, you know, it would lead me to believe that if all the internal plugins and most and every plugins except for two kind of have that behavior um, that it would be kind of down to the plugin or maybe the plugin is utilized a different way, you know, maybe in the signal flow that could cause it, but it, it, it would lead me to think that it could be the plugins that are causing that particular issue. All right, so we have a question. Um, is there a way to showcase the volume automation directly on the event? Uh, I think you could do this in Logic. So while it doesn't go directly on the event because you realize that 
a lot of times the events themselves will have uh, you know uh, you know if we have 40 parameters that are automated so let's say if I'm here and I have automation and I wanted to see uh, the automation directly on the event what you could do is if you go to the automation panel once you open it up uh, go to op go to settings and then you can say show data on tracks and now at this point we could just see the waveform and see the automation so as soon as we open up the automation you could see the waveform underneath and be able to have a reference with that but you could you don't have to have multiple automation events on top of the same track or constantly be switching you could see multiple automation events and that really you know helps when you're doing stuff like dolby atmos panning and stuff like that Or you see from Spike Williams uh, says uh, John Barry to John Barry's comment. It's great to explore Cubase, but Greg gives us a fast track to solve problems we never realized we had. Thanks, Greg. So you're welcome. And John Barry said uh, for the um, for the control room, another great thing you could do is utilize a reference track. So let's uh, let me just go to a different project. That's a great point, John. Thanks for mentioning that. Let me see if I have this one project open or. So let's say I wanted to have a reference track and a lot of times when we have reference tracks we don't necessarily want the reference track to play um, you know to play through our master effects processing chain uh, so if we wanted let's say we had this as a particular reference track I'm going to EQ it so that the YouTube police won't get me um, so let's say if I just load a track um, and we want to be able to use it as a reference track, um, we, this is also another great use of the control room. So what we could do is I'm going to take, we're going to go to the control room. So we go to our audio connections and we want to add uh, what's called a Q mix. And I already have some in here. So I'll just, we'll call this reference. So what I'm going to do is to this particular track, I'm going to open it up and we're going to say um, my output is going to no bus. I go to the Q sends and now it's going to be going out of Q mix one. All right. So if I wanted to listen to my project, every single track in this project is going to go through the full mixing prop, full mixing and also through my master effects processing. But if we had something, a track that was already previously mastered and we didn't want to go through that same path, I could take this particular track, this 24 bit mix track, and we send it to our Q mix. So now as we listen to it. So when we sell our track, we're not gonna hear it because it's not going through our master output but if I go to Q mix one I can say we're listening to our internal mix now when I go to Q mix one now it's playing our reference track and nothing else is playing so I could go between my mix and let's say the reference track and go back and forth So this way we could have a reference track without having to spend like you know extra money on another a b type plugin we could just simply have an alternate routing path for monitoring so that's another great use of the control room and thanks for reminding me of that john all right john costigan says this is a great time for like button so that's great jazz you said there's 99 likes who's going to be number 100 
All right, so we see uh, just comment about the automation. It says showing the automation panel option helps. Thanks, but however, having the option of showcasing it directly on the event would also be nice, quick access to the automation. Uh, no need for more lanes per track. You know, also we could do on the track itself. You know, there's one is we could have kind of clip automation. So we could do that on the track, but we could also just draw. It's well, it's not automation. It's pre-clip gain. So we could have different uh, different gain structure changes. So we could do that. We can see that this actually happens before, and then we could just open up and have automation as well. So we could have kind of multiple automation points. So if you wanted to have kind of volume uh, pre-gain volume changes on the clip to kind of regulate stuff for you know before it hits a compressor we could do stuff like that as well so we could do volume changes on a clip but it's not technically automation but it will play back as well but you know but there is kind of pre-gain volume changes that you could do already All right, so we see from uh, Jeweler to Rocket, um, how to speed or slow a sampler while syncing it to the BPM. All right, so let me just come over here. All right, so let's say if we have, um, all right, so let's say I have just an empty sampler track and I want, let's say I have just a single note here that, and let me just set this to mix so we get all here. So I have a note that's going into Retrolog and I want to drag that to the sampler track. All right, so um, all right, I'm just okay. So it says, um, right, just let me, uh, how to speed or slow a sampler while syncing it to the BPM. Um, so if we let's say if I take a drum loop instead so i'm going to take a drum loop and drag it in so right now if we don't want it to sync to the bpm we could change the pitch and as we change the pitch it's going to and let's say our original speed is here so if i want it to play at different pitches so that's going to change the bpm as we slow it down. But if I wanted to change the pitch, uh, what I would do is just activate audio warp. And once we have uh, our audio warp turned on, so we come right over here. Now as I play, it's gonna play back at the same, it's gonna sync to the tempo, it's playing back, but now it's just changing the pitch. So if I wanted to even play a chord of a drum loop. So let me know if that's what you want to do. So you did to, to slow it down like pitch wise, but still have it sync uh, to the to the tempo, to the beat. So let me know if that's helpful, Jeweler to Rocket. All right, so we see uh, Johnny Ray from the Bay Area is in the chat. Thanks for joining us. OK, 
Okay, so we see Tiago just says, I agree with the idea of a project version. I'm not sure if it's easily feasible, but for me, it would, it would save some time. I have many edits and mixing processes which occur simultaneously. Uh, so, since mixing snapshots may not hold automation info, transitioning between mixes and edits may be imprecise. I would like to uh, be nice to wrap all edits and mix snapshots together. So, yeah, at that point, you have to, you know, you know, it also gets to the point where it's like when you have so many parts, your project could grow so large, you know, with all those different options that it may not be as feasible taking up, you know, more and more memory every time that you wanted to just go back and forth. So, but I think that, you know, like I wouldn't expect to be in Word and to change the 12th version of a document and have all those changes automatically apply to every previous you know word document that was in the, saved in the same folder starting with the same name for instance all right all right we'll see if there's any more questions that come in I think we're at the end of questions. Now we could wrap up. I know we have a three-day weekend in the United States. So probably lots of people have already started their holiday. I'll we'll have to do all the live stream indexing tonight. But we'll see if there's any more questions. And again, Tuesday we'll be doing our normal uh, end of month Zoom meetup. So uh, our guest is someone who has again worked with, um, you know, Bob Dylan. Uh, I think he actually replaced a Mark Knopfler solo on a Bob Dylan track. Uh, uh, and he's worked with Harry Belfonte, Whitney Houston when she got signed. I think he was the guitarist in her band initially and played her showcase for Clive Davis. Uh, Brian Wilson, um, you know, so all sorts of wonderful artists. All right, so we see uh, John Barry just says, uh, I worked out the reverse piano trick if you want to know it. So, um, yeah, uh, if you want, I think I, I have your email when you sent the video, so I'll see if I can dig up your email. Um, but I, I think if I reply to your email that you probably have my email address, so you could probably send it to me that way if you want. All right, so we see Terry Gray just saying, thanks, Greg, great stream. Spike Williams saying, enjoy weekend with cubase family he's got a dash all right let's we'll see if there's any more quick questions that come in if not we'll wrap up early and make my indexing get done earlier tonight i want to thank everyone for all the wonderful questions and if you've learned a new tip or trick make sure that you do hit the like button and i see that since i've finished up the questions i get the gold trophy from agent k which is always great to see All right. So we see Tiago saying many thanks for all your teachings, Greg. Steinberg created a great virtual Cubase community. So it seemed like a good thing to do during COVID. All right, we'll see if there's any last minute questions that sneak in. If not, we'll wrap up. And we want everyone to stay safe and healthy. And we'll look forward to having a great guest on Tuesday. Um, so if you're able to make the Zoom, we'll provide the Zoom, uh, Zoom meetup information in the live stream. All right, so a, qu a quick question. Uh, is there another way of converting a stereo track to mono? The way I do it, I convert it in the audio pool at the moment. Um, so really all you have to do is, let's say we have a stereo track here. Um, select the track. Go to project uh, and we'll see convert tracks multi-channel to mono and hit OK. And then you'll have your two mono tracks directly below. So you don't have to go into the pool to do it. You could just do it directly from project convert tracks multi-channel to mono or mono to multi-channel. And that will also do 5171 in addition to stereo.
All right, so we just see, um, quick question, um, how do you activate control room? So once you go to your studio, go to audio connections, you'll see a control room tab. You want to make sure that it's turned on right here. And then you want to define like your output. So if you want to add speakers, like if you're just starting, right click and add the monitor, and then you could give it a name. So I have like my Yamaha HS7s and then define your audio interface and the outputs where your audio is connected. Once we have your speakers connected here, make sure you go to the outputs and you could have your stereo out, but leave it not connected because if you have this connected at the same time, the sound will get sent out twice. It seems counterintuitive at first, but that's how you could get the control room kind of start it. All right, we'll see if there's just any more last minute questions. And there's usually about 30 seconds from when I talk to when you guys hear. So I'll just see if there's any last minute questions. If not, we'll wrap up early. Everyone can get their, I know it's holiday weekend in Germany and the United States. So just wait just another little minute. Okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up. So we look forward to seeing new faces on the Zoom meetup on Tuesday. Uh, and we'll look forward, uh, want everyone to have, if you have a holiday weekend, I know it's in Germany, the United States, have a wonderful Memorial Day in the United States. And uh, I'm not sure the name of the holiday in Germany, but, uh, you know, but have a wonderful three-day weekend. And we hope that everyone's starting to have like lovely weather. If you're in the northern hemisphere, it's kind of the in the United States. This, this is kind of the unofficial start to summer, so uh, Memorial Day. Um, so, but we hope everyone has a wonderful holiday. And if you're in the southern hemisphere, that you'll soon be moving into winter. So, but uh, everyone stay safe and healthy, and we'll see everyone back on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Goodbye.